today, our speaker is Kevin Long from NASC. And Kevin has been working in the field of biology since graduating from Oregon State in 1993. Before coming to NASC in 2002, he worked on various biological studies on everything from legless lizards to bald eagles. We'll have to talk about that later. Um, Kevin is responsible for project development, permitting, implementation, and contracting required to implement NASC's large scale salmon habitat restoration projects. He thinks of himself as an interpreter between the ecosystems we are restoring and the stakeholders, funders, designers, regulatory agency, and construction contractors involved in getting these restoration projects on the ground. Something you might not think about, but there's a lot of moving pieces when you have a big project like these. An avid surfer, forager, and backpacker, Kevin is most at home in the woods, on the water, and in his expansive garden. Thank you so much for joining us, Kevin. Hello, everyone. Let me get this. I'm supposed to put two mics on because what I have to say is so important. Uh, it's been three years since I have done an in-person presentation. Let me just say that this is a this is a trip. I've done a lot of Zoom presentations, so nice to have a live audience. Super cool. Uh, obviously, here to talk to you about stage eight restoration today, and. Uh, just to start off, if you watched any of the, if you saw any of the advertisement that the Marine Science Center did for this, this presentation, you saw my headshot. <laughs> yes, the beard is a little bit darker than it is today, but I ran across this picture when they asked me for a headshot. And a lot of people ask me when these, after seeing this, like, what's up with the picture, Kevin? What's going on? <laughs> Including my mother who's sitting right over there. <clears throat> And this is just to demonstrate that sometimes I become immersed in my work. So here at the North Olympic Salmon Coalition, uh, we are a private nonprofit. Uh, we are also known as a reg regional fisheries enhancement group. And fisheries enhancement groups were created by the state 30 years ago as a way to do habitat restoration, uh, salmon habitat restoration in the state of Washington. So there's uh, 13 of us all over the state, and we are the North Olympic uh, organization for that. Um, our mission is to promote robust wild salmon stocks for families, fishers, and local economies by furthering habitat restoration and education on the North Olympic Peninsula. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we do that today. A little introduction, ju introduction just to who NOSC is. Um, so education, this is a big part for us, whether we're working with kids uh, in the seventh grade classroom through our Real Learning, Real Work program, um, where we teach STEM education, uh, take lessons into the classroom, and then take the kids out of the classroom and put their feet on the ground on uh, some of our habitat restoration projects. Uh, and of course, also working with adults. And the way we do that is primarily through getting adults on the ground on volunteer activities, whether we're planting, stream, planting trees on some of the streams we were working to restore uh, or doing spawner surveys, out counting fish and seeing how the fish are returning. Uh, that's how we like to get the adults out and get to engage. And of course, doing things like this to try to uh, let people know what's going on out there and what they can do to help. <clears throat> and then the part of the, uh, what we do that I'm most involved with is active habitat restoration. And on this slide here, uh, let me see. I didn't play with the pointer beforehand. Let's see if I can hear it. Just to point out some of our um, projects that we've done. There's um, Morse Creek project. This is a big log jam project we did uh, 2008. We've done some work on the Dungeness, uh, primarily planting and restoration on the Dungeness. This is out at Three Crabs. If you've ever been on the Three Crabs, a big habitat and estuary restoration project that we did down there. I encourage you to go visit that. Uh, this is the bridge and uh, channel at uh, Killisa Harbor between Indian Island and Marrowstone. Hopefully you're familiar with that one. Some small scale stuff just out in the woods, out on the Hoko River, um, taking out culverts uh, that are that have been left behind on the landscape. And some bigger stuff on the Hoko where look at the size of this culvert we got to take out. Um, that culvert right there happened to be 
12 feet high and 200 feet long and underneath the road fill that was almost 100 feet high. And we took that culvert completely out. So um, that's some of the work that we do towards habitat restoration. And um, I wanted to say, what did I want to say? <clears throat> I'm going to take you through some of our upcoming habitat restoration projects in this in this presentation. And we take you from one end of our region to the other. If you looked at that other map, you'll notice that the North Olympic Salmon Coalition, we work from Mia Bay down to the Hood Canal Bridge over here somewhere. And the two projects I'm going to talk about today are also opposite ends of our region, out on the Hoko River, which is out near CQ and Column Bay, and then one here in Snow Creek, which is obviously really close to us here in Discovery Bay. Uh, most of my most of my presentation material will be from the Hoko River because it was just a really good demonstration and I wanted to take you guys maybe a little bit further away from Port Townsend today. <clears throat> so we'll start just with a brief introduction to each project. Uh, first project on the Hoko River, we call it the Upper Cowan Ranch, Upper Cowan Ranch Restoration Design Project. Uh, it is on a portion of property that's owned by Washington State Parks and we're working with them to see about doing some restoration on a section of river that is uh, severely degraded. This is a picture of a piece of it. Um, here's a little zoom in on that map. You'll see CQ and Clallam Bay there in the upper right. And we have actually got multiple things going on in the Hoko River watershed. A couple of the other projects show up here, but I'm gonna focus today on the Cowan Ranch project. So at the site on the Hoko River, and if you don't know or don't, Think you know where the Hoko River is? If you've ever gone to Ozette Lake, you've driven along the Hoko River for most of the length of the Hoko. It goes right, the road goes right along it for a good part of the length. <clears throat> Here's a shot of the Hoko River right in the middle of the project site. If you know rivers, you know this isn't a really beautiful section of river. And one thing I would ask you is which direction is this water flowing? Can you tell? You should be able to tell in a river. <laughs> Here's looking the other direction, and I'll tell you that we are looking up the river here, so the water's coming at you, but it's still really hard to tell. And this, this is not normal for our Western river systems to stand along the side of it and wonder which way it's flowing. <clears throat> here I'm standing at a riffle crest looking downstream. You'll notice the systems are just really simple. There's not much going on here. And I'll, I'll dig into that a little bit more as we go forward, but I just wanted to show you kind of our existing conditions of what this project looks like today. Here we are out, out doing some surveys, trying to figure out what we're gonna do about this reach. And here's a look at a concept design. So we go through multiple design design phases as we're doing design. And the concept design is really just a cartoon about what should we do with this river system? And there's a lot going on here. I'm sure you cannot see it all or read it all, and it's not exactly the point, but I'll show you where the river's existing alignment is. It's right there in that yellow. So that's the river's existing alignment. It is ru running from the left-hand side of the screen to the right-hand side of the screen. And some of the ideas about what we wanna do out here is add a whole bunch of channel length. We're gonna add channels along the side here and make this reach braided. We're gonna take and we're gonna excavate big sections of floodplain. And you'll learn why as we go through this presentation, why we would want to do that, why that's important to do. We're gonna put a whole bunch of wood in the creek river. Uh, we're gonna plant giant sections of, of floodplain that are all covered in reed carrying grass with trees. You look at it now and this is all just field habitat. This is the west end of the peninsula. It's not supposed to be field along the sides of the streams. It's supposed to be big forests. And that makes a difference. Oop, wrong way. So what are we gonna do here? We're gonna take the channel length from 2,600 to 9,800 feet in length. Um, we're gonna have a place that has no China, side channels. We're gonna have four. Um, the floodplain that's existing there now, there's less than an acre of floodplain. There'll be more than 13 acres of floodplain. Uh, pools are going to go from 8 to 80. So tenfold increase in the number of pools through this reach. Um, right now, there's not any log jams in this entire reach. This is about a half a mile of river. We're going to have over, what's it say, 65? And uh, 
take the forested valley bottom from less than 10 acres to 34 acres. So just that increase should make sense why that matters. Um, and as we go through, you'll understand even more maybe why that, why it looks like that way now, why it looks so degraded now. So jumping closer to home over to uh, Discovery Bay, take you to Snow Creek Uncas Preserve. And if you wanted to visit this spot, this is a Jefferson Land Trust Preserve. And if you found your way to the West Uncas Road Bridge on Snow Creek and went just a little bit past it, you would find a place to park and you can actually go explore this property on your own because the land trust lets people visit. Um, take your walking sticks and uh, be prepared to go up, you know, through a little bit of brush, but it's really kind of a neat spot. And this is a spot where we're going to be doing a restoration project this coming summer. So if you want to see what it looks like before, this is your chance. Uh, it is uh, just a mile up from Discovery Bay. Uh, we have, again, we have multiple projects we're working on in Discovery Bay. This is the one I'm going to focus on with you today. And looking at Snow Creek, you'll notice that it's got a little bit more going on in the Hoko. It's a lot smaller than the Hoko. Um, it's got a little more diversity, a little more habitat cover, but it's still got a lot of problems. And we'll talk about those as we go forward with this. Not a lot of wood in the stream here. Um, not great conifer cover along the edges of the stream. So here's a look at the, this design plan. At this design, we're at 60%. So we've jumped up from that cartoon to something that's much more detailed. We're starting to figure out how are we actually going to build this thing. So again, there's way more here than you are going to need to know for this presentation. But this is what it looks like when we, this is what, like basically what we would show a contractor when we're like, we want you to go build this. And then there's another 34 sheets that tell them how to build this. So the yellow is the stream here. And here you can see all of these little sticks. Those are all pieces of wood that are about 40 feet long, 24 inches around at the base. A lot of them have their root wads attached. Um, basically we're gonna take a bunch of log trucks, back them up to the creek and put all the logs in the creek because that's where they belong. Um, <clears throat> And we're gonna do some floodplain excavation here. Um, we're gonna build some ripples in the stream to kind of raise the stream levels up and you'll understand why that's important by the end of the talk too, hopefully. Um, so pretty, um, pretty aggressive action to a system of, of, of creek that's pretty degraded and having a lot of problems actually supporting fish and uh, is actually actively eroding and every day is dumping a bunch of silt into the creek because of the way that the creek is basically unraveling. So we're gonna to try to stop it from unraveling and start sending it to another direction. Here, besides stopping that unraveling, we're also adding a whole bunch of habitat. You'll see that we're you know, nearly doubling the channel length through the project. Uh, we're um, increasing the floodplain from 2.8 to 4.5 acres. And number of pools is gonna go way up. This one happens to be in a little better shape. You can see at least we have 20 pools now. Um, but we're going to take that up to around 50. And just the area of aquatic cover is going to go from 2,000 square feet to about 10,000 square feet. And this is about similar length of project. This is also about a half a mile of stream on Snow Creek. So I wanted to show you something in real life. Uh, this is a project uh, in South Sound, and it is done by a sister fish enhancement group, South Puget Sound Enhancement Group. And this is a river that actually looks a lot like the Hoko River would look like from the air right now today. Very similar site. This is a project they did in 2021. This is the exact same view as that. So they took this and they turned it into that. And so you can start to see where those plans start to look like real life. You can see all the sticks they added. You can see all the diversity they added. They added a side channel. All those little blue tubes, those are all trees that volunteers have come in and planted afterwards to grow a riparian forest in what used to be a farmer's field that was flooding all the time. <clears throat> so again, you could still be sitting there saying, okay, well, well, why do we do this? Why is, it, why is this important for fish? Who cares about wood? You know, and maybe you understand the importance, um, but I'm just gonna dig into it a little bit to make sure. Um, so I said that I become immersed in my work at times. This is me and my wife. Uh, one thing we love to do on the sunny weekends when the fish are running is put on our snorkeling gear and go snorkel with the fish. I mean, why not? The water's 45 degrees, sunny. Uh, and so 
we get to go and explore some of the rivers and go snorkeling. And what you will see, like actually this one shot here, this is at the Morris Creek project. You can see that's a constructed log jam in the background there. When you put your face underwater in our rivers, you see some amazing things. Um, the juvenile fish flock to wood. You go and stick your head into a log jam and you will see more fish than you could possibly imagine. And you look at it from above the water and you won't see a single fish. There's no fish in there. Put your head under the water and take a look again. <clears throat> the adults hang out around the root, wa root, root wads and rest. Uh, then they come up and they spawn in the riffles. If you don't have the places for them to rest and you don't have the places for them to spawn, guess what? You've got a problem. Now I got this picture of this tiny little, uh, this is a little tiny coho fry. And this is in some very shallow water, maybe an inch of water that's up behind a log jam. And this is in a section of river where previously there was just rushing water. There was no place for this fish to hide. And it was sitting in perfectly still water. It was barely perceptibly moving. And this fish was just as happy as could be. But before there was no place for this fish to be before there was a log jam, jam here. So if you can't support these little babies, you can't support a salmon run. So let's see here. So taking this from real life into why. Okay, so this that's the why. It's really easy to understand. Okay, fish need wood, fish need this habitat. But this is based on something bigger, and this is kind of what I, the stage eight part of my talk is about. Is like, what is the theory that <clears throat> is behind this work? What's the science that's behind this work? And it it's been the stream evolution model and talks about stream evolution has been going on for decades. But Kluwer and Thorne really broke it open in 2013 when they came up with this stream evolution model. And I'm going to take it through. Take it take you through it somewhat stepwise. And we're just gonna look at stage zero. Stage zero is like the natural state of a river in our in area. It's an anastomosing channel, which means it has multiple channels running all over the place. It's connected to its floodplain. Uh, stage zero, like normally I think of zero as being a bad thing. Stage zero is where we want our rivers, okay? Can you think of a stage zero river near us? multi-threaded channel connected to its floodplain. I had to think about this. The whole river is about the closest that I could come up with. Here's a picture of the whole river. See what I'm talking about? You've got all these multi-threaded channels. Um, the floodplain is just really well connected. There's all these little islands. There's channels running all over the place, tons of diversity. This is a, this is a stage zero river, okay? Yeah, about where is that? Upstream from 101. This, yeah, I think this is just upstream from 101 a little ways, not quite to the park. Yeah. This is a photo. I have a number of photos from John Gusman, who um, is an amazing photographer on the peninsula here, who supports us by sharing his photos with us a lot. Um, so, so look at the, and I also, it matches really well with this graphic that I found as well of stage zero. Uh, so, this is, again, this is from a paper uh, by Howard et al. and talks about stage zero systems and what they provide to um, the ecosystem. And uh, I've heard somebody say that uh, the stage zero river supports everything from the bugs to the bears. And that's what you see here. Um, you have the more water, Heard water is life. Have you heard that before? The more water you have on the surface running through all these valleys, the better, the more life you have. And it starts with the uh, nitrogen cycle and what's going on down in the down in the ground, supporting little bugs, supporting our base of our food chain. And then you'll see these little areas where it says delta T. That's change in temperature, right? So you've got cool water coming up from underneath up into the river supporting, here we have some young fish. You've got this cool water running below our rivers and running through our gravels. That's what keeps our salmon eggs cool and oxygenated. <clears throat> then you've got the fish hanging out, or the, the kingfishers rather, hanging out, eating the fish. 
amphibians in these wetlands along the sides. You have this running all over. Some of the water's high. The water's running up on these floodplains, creating all these wetlands. Now you've got all this habitat for amphibians, bugs, insects. Um, again, look at the groundwater running through and keeping the tadpoles cool in the ponds. Supports places for our un big ungulates to come out and browse, feeds that grass so they have lots to eat, which feeds our predators. This happens to be a graphic from where there was wolves. So the wolves have, are chasing the elk. And again, that nitrogen cycling is taking place, the nutrient cycling is taking place and feeding this whole system. And then you have the salmon coming back and putting marine derived nutrients back into the ground. So this is what happens in a stage zero river. So what happens when we move on to the landscape? Things start to look a little bit different, which is why I had to fly all the way to the Hoe to find a stage zero river. Our rivers don't tend to look like that anymore. Our streams don't tend to look like that. And this is, this is, this is why we come in and where do you wanna live if you live near a creek? It's really nice to live right on the edge of it. So we come in and we clear and we put in houses. This is a picture of the Hoko River and actually a property that we're trying to work with the tribes and state parks to acquire um, because it's constraining our restoration opportunities there. We bring in invasive species. All of those grasses along those sections of the Hoko River I showed you, that's all invasive reed canary grass. It's horrible stuff, horrible riparian habitat. Really doesn't do anything for that previous graphic of, of feeding the fish and wildlife that are out there. We put roads right along the sides of the river. This again, this is the Hoko Ozet Road. There's the Hoko, there's the Hoko Ozet Road. Um, we constrain them with systems like that, partially because it's the easiest place, it was the easiest place to build roads is right up the river, right? And then of course there's timber harvest. This happens to be Umbrella Creek. I'll have another slide of that here in a minute. In a minute. And we clear log jams out of rivers, or historically we did, and that we'll go through that in a minute as well. So those are the impacts we start to have, and you'll notice there's a lot le less water on the surface here than there was in the stage zero cartoon. So I wanna dig in, especially on the Hoko and, and Snow Creek too, one thing that happened is channel clearing, where they would actually, this is in the 50s, uh, 20s, 10s. Um, this, our rivers would get choked with this wonderful wood. I shouldn't even use the word choked. You know, they were filled with wood and log jams. Uh, and that's actually a good thing for the river. But it's not a good thing if you're wanting to use the rivers to transport wood to market, which is something that happened in Hoko quite a bit. Uh, they would actually have log drives on the Hoko River. And to do that, they would build temporary dams on the Hoko, build a Hoko full of wood, log cut logs, and then they would blow the dam or open the dam and they'd let all of the logs rush out to sea. And just imagine what a ton of logs ripping down a river does to the river. Um, and also those log jams are all in the way. So they had to go and clear those log jams before they could do that. So that, that scar is still on the landscape. The river's been unable to heal from that. Um, the, the graphic on this, I thought it was in, in, interesting. The graphic written at the bottom, you probably can't read it, but it says Riv Poco River taking aeroplane spruce logs. <clears throat> and I did not mistype aeroplane. Um, so that there was, this is big, this is big business. You know, this is, this is like 1920s getting going out there. Um, and it was, it's just what we, it's what we did. It's the resource extraction that we did. And, and to this day, it continues. This is the Umbrella Creek watershed, the Hoko, um, what was that lake? This is one corner of Ozette Lake right here. And this is, this is Umbrella Creek. Where's the creeks on here? The only way you can tell is because there's a hundred foot strip of trees around the creeks. So all of these things, all of these different impacts that I mentioned, they actually have pretty similar things that they do to the river. One, they decrease, they decrease the length of the channel in any given area, which increases channel slope, right? If it's shorter, it's gonna be steeper. You lose that channel complexity by taking all that wood. You lose roughness. And this is a word I like to talk about because it's all the 
you hear it from my engineers all the time, we're looking to increase surface roughness. What is roughness? Roughness is all the brush on the floodplain that when the water comes up and it's running through that brush, that's roughness. That slows down the water. Those log jams in the, in the creek, that's roughness. It's slowing down the water. So um, just think about it as this texture on the landscape. Water racing across a field, there's no roughness. The water, nothing to slow the water down. Running, water running through a forest that's got a bunch of understory brush in it has a ton of roughness and everything slows down. And the fish can go in the, can swim into that forest and hang out in those bushes versus going into a field where the current's going just as fast as it in the, is in the river. So think about roughness when next time you go out on a stream. Uh, the floodways, floodways gotten confined by, you know, pinching it in between a road or whatever other infrastructure we put on the floodplain. We've actually lost floodplain to agriculture or to houses or whatever it might be. Um, and we've lost forest cover. So what do all of those effects eventually do? They increase our stream velocities. Every one of those things will make stream velocity go up. And when the stream velocities go up, we're gonna go back to our stream evolution model. And what happens is your creek starts to cut. You start to wash away the bed. You start to scour away the banks. It's got too much energy. It can't handle it. It starts to unravel. So we move down into stage three or four and you'll notice the channel shape on these. We've gone from this really flat anastomosing multi-threaded channel connected to a floodplain down to something that's very U-shaped and not connected to its floodplain anymore. And that's where the Hoko and Snow Creek projects are sitting right now. They're sitting in stage three or four. They're, de they're degraded. So de degraded is a little bit confusing because you think of just like, oh, it's, it's in bad shape. Well, it's actually incised, it's degraded, it's cut down into its bed. So it's degraded in more than one way, right? So you hear me talking about the degradation or incision a lot in this, in this talk. This is a tributary on the Hoko River. And this is a system where the landowner has been removing wood for decades. Um, and this is the result. Um, this is uh, July and upstream of his property and downstream of his property, there is water in the channel, but through his property, there is not. So probably not as good a fish habitat here. <laughs> There's not any water. Uh, not to mention that when the flows do come up through here, he says it sounds like a freight train and I believe him. You know, this bank is what, 15 feet tall? Pretty remarkable what we can do to the landscape. So as these channels evolve, so is the habitat. And this is one place where Kluwer and Thorne dug in a little bit. And again, you don't need to understand everything that's going on here, um, but the two pies, one of them, boy, this is great. I've got this cord all wrapped up in my glasses. <laughs> Excuse me. So the, the left pie is hydrogeomorphic attributes. That's the water earth interaction, right? Um, so as you're physical channel dimensions, it's the channel and floodplain features, it's what the substrate is like, it's what the hydraulics are doing, it's what the vegetation is, it's all the complexity in the channel. And then the right-hand pie, those are our habitat and ecosystem benefits table. So it's the habitat, it's the water quality, it's the biota that's there, and it's how resilient the system is. And then besides the slices of the pie, there's the sizes of the pie. So as these get smaller, there's less of all the good stuff, right? So you want to, you go to Thanksgiving, you want a big pie with lots of slices in it. You don't want a little pie, you want lots of different flavors, right? So stage three and four, notice how small our pies have gotten. They've got 20, less 25% or less than 25% of the percentage of benefits that the stage zero system had. So we've lost all of that good stuff. Um, turns out fish like pie too, and they're not getting it in stage three and four. So I'm gonna step away from the stream evolution model and take you back to the real world again. So here we are on the banks of the Hoko again. 
What do you see? I heard the word elk. Did somebody say elk? <laughs> of course, it's the first thing we're going to see. We're going to see elk. It's the reason I stopped and took this picture, right? But what else do we notice when we look at this section of the hoko, which is uh, near, the, what's that? It's quite wide. Yeah. More covered. So here's some of the things I know. So as I mentioned, somebody mentioned cover. There's, there is definitely some cover here and we can talk, we'll talk about that in a minute. But we've got, you know, here's a little bit of wood in the channel. That's a good thing. There's the elk, it's a pretty river. We've got riparian cover, we've got riparian trees. So you can look at this and say, what's wrong with it? It looks fine. It looks, it's pretty. I don't wanna ruin it for you because <laughs> it is pretty. But this is what you start to see when you um, get a little more educated about what's going on. Sure, there's repairing co cover, but there is not a singer, single conifer in this picture. Um, there's almost no wood in this channel at all. Think about that black and white photo I showed you of the log jams. This should be filled with wood. Um, it's got invasive weeds on the thing. The elk are standing in a big patch of green canary grass, which has very little browse quality for them. Like they may be eating it, but it's not great browse. Bunch of green canary grass there. And then I'm actually standing on a road. Like if I took one step forward, I would be in the Hoko River. This isn't a good, this is not a pretty picture, unfortunately. So what else do you see? And this, you need, you need x-ray vision to see this a little bit. But look at the channel shape that we have running through here. Those are the floodplains up there, the high spots. I think I marked them. So your floodplains up here. So in do, getting ready for this work, we did an assessment in the lower hoko. The lower hoko is derated four to eight feet. It is cut down. So that means in order for it to get water up onto the floodplains, it has to come up four to eight feet just to get the floodplains wet. So you end up with this, you have this trapezoidal channel, kind of that U-shaped channel that I showed you in that stage three or four, not a great situation. So here's some other shots of the Hoko River, just to kind of demonstrate some of that incision. And these pictures, this is where you would expect the bed of the river to be. So this is where the gravel that the fish should be spawning is, is the yellow lines. You can see the extreme degradation that we've, we've encountered here. And for those of you paying a lot of attention, people wonder what this structure in the background is. That's an old railroad trestle um, from part of the uh, resource extraction that took place out here, uh, out in a farmer's field, just as, so you go out there, it's kind of weird, you're in the middle of this farmer's field and there's like this, it's a little bit like Stonehenge. It's like, what is that doing out there? But like they actually, a lot of them got harvested. A lot of people came in and took a lot of the piling, but then there's these few vents that are left and it's just kind of a trip. So here we are on the Hoko River again. I'm taking it down to the elk side view. We're down where they were standing along the river there. And we ask you what you notice here. No wood. What I noticed is, look, there's a tree. There is a conifer in this picture. <laughs> yes. This is a big old spruce, about four or five feet at its base to give you a sense of the scale here. And these would have been every 50 feet along the Hopo. That's what you would have had. And now we have one here in this reach, which is fantastic. Um, it's trying to recruit to the river, which is what we call when a tree falls in the river, we call it recruiting. So it's about to recruit to the river, um, which is a great thing, except that in the hoko, when we recruit this big wood, because there's no other wood, what happens is that by it falls in the middle of the night, by daybreak, it is floating around in the Strait of Juan de Fuca because there's nothing for it to hang up and stop on. So that fish habitat just washes downstream. So not only is it not a beautiful tree standing on our banks, Kevin's not standing there going, look at that beautiful dead tree in the river, you know. So we have a tree, but again, we have this incredible trapezoidal channel. You know, in this particular reach, we've got almost six, probably maybe eight feet of incision through here. The floodplain is way up there. And so we're standing out here at base flow. A base flow on a river is kind of your, think about it as your, maybe your summer flows. It's, it's the flow that you have when there's not rainwater coursing through the system. It's 
tends to be kind of groundwater driven. Uh, so we'll call this base flow. It's maybe a little higher than base flow, but this is when I was, this is when the elk were taking the picture. Uh, so here's what it looks like at a flood flow. And I put that little white circle on there. We actually went out and surveyed. There had been a big 50 year flood event that came through before we did the survey. And the way we could tell how high the flood waters got is there was grass up in the branches. So we were actually surveying the elevation of the grass and the branches. And they, the, the engineers have created hydraulic models for these projects, right? So they, we've got gauges on this river. We know how high the river got on the gauge. And they have a model that tells them how high the water will be on the Earth's surface at a certain flow. So they wanted to know how exactly how high is that grass? And then they took it back and compared to their model and their model was within an inch. So kind of neat. Uh, but those flows, base flow, we're at 150 CFS. CFS is cubic feet per second. So 150 cubic feet per second during the summertime. During the 50 year event that we experienced on the Hoko this particular year, it went up to a, I did the math earlier, 134 times or as much, is that right? I think it is. So in a 50 year event, now you have 134 times as much water and it's moving through the same size channel. Look at the, it did never, it never got up onto the floodplain. So that means that water is just racing downstream. Now, if, if it was in an anastomosing channel, that water would have gone out into the floodplain and this would have looked instead of like the Hoko River, it would look like the Hoko Lake, right? Just this big, slow moving body of water. But it's not, it's a freight train and it's racing down the Hoko. So here's our juvenile coho salmon who's been paying attention to this talk. Does he look concerned? Maybe a little stressed? I think he does. Oh, the whole, all the life stages are concerned out here, you guys. Um, you know, the, of course, the adults here on the right, they come back and they're still spawning. They're spawning in this ripple right here, right, right where the pictures are. They will spawn in there. But what happens is when that 50 year event comes through, those eggs don't stand a chance. All the gravel mobilizes and all the eggs mobilize and those e eggs need to stay put. If the ones, the eggs that manage to make it and move on to ale bin, which is the next little guys with the orange bellies there, move on to the ale bins, they're still down in the gravel. They don't swim very well. They got a belly full of yolk. They do not move very well. Once they are up, moved into the water column, they don't stand a chance. And then you've got our coho salmon here, our concerned friend. He has to spend a whole, they have to spend a whole year in the system. They hatch and they will spend an entire year in the system as these par feeding and getting bigger before they go to sea. When the flows come up like that, they have to go and they have to be able to hide behind a piece of wood. They have to be able to get up on the floodplain or to go hang out in the forest for a while, hang out behind a big tree in the middle of the forest. And then when the water comes down, swim back into the channel. That's not available to them here. So our stocks are in are suffering, suffering horribly out here from impacts like this. So the little coho is not the only one who's a little daunted and concerned. So you have that story going on, but then the other thing you've got going on, I mean, there's a lot, it's, it's a super complex topic. The other thing you've got going on is the river's just on the surface but there's all this groundwater stuff going on underneath. You know, you've got your groundwater aquifer and then you have this hyperrheic alluvial aquifer. The hyperrheic alluvial aquifer, basically that's a river moving underground, underneath the river. It's just this cool water moving through. Um, and what happens is when you have a river in size that much, the phone rings. <laughs> so think about, this one's a little, this, this graphic's a little bit backwards but it's from a paper, so I didn't want to flip it around. But it's showing what happens when we restore a system. I've been going the other way, so I'm going to go the other way. So start here. This is, this is stage zero, right? We've got the water real close to the top of the channel. It can get out on the floodplain if it wants. But then we have the severe degradation. And when we degrade, look what happens to our water. Look what happens to our groundwater. Our groundwater 
comes down to because that groundwater, as you nick into the surface of the earth, it just runs out into the river, right? So the lower your river goes, the lower it's gonna pull down all your groundwater. And that means all the plants growing on the surface that had their, their roots and connectivity with the groundwater, all those wetland plants, they can't reach the groundwater anymore. Our wetlands dry up, our forests dry up. So this is showing what we do if we go from a system like this and we jam it up with a bunch of wood, we jam, we can make the water go back up and we can bring our groundwater levels back up. Um, so you'll hear something about the desert, desertification of the Pacific Northwest. Basically that we're becoming a desert in some places. And it's hard to believe that a places that gets, the Hoko gets 140 inches of rain a year is experiencing desertification, but it is. Um, because of things like this, and then also the, the extreme logging that we're doing is actually letting the sun bake the surface of the earth that much more and is drying out all of our soils. So we have these nicks down into our soils and then we have the sun baking it. And then the good news is that climate change makes it worse. And now you're going like, why did B invite this guy to this? That's not what I wanted to hear about. So, that's what we're working on is we're working to fix this, figuring out how to fix this, okay? We're smart, we created the problem, we can, we can get our way out of this. And so that's what stage eight restoration is about. Back to our stream evolution model is taking, this system would typically would go around this wheel typically if we didn't get in the way. It would take a long time for it to go from here to work its way around to stage eight. And stage eight is basically where you have an anastomosing channel inside this nicked landscape. And I think maybe it makes more sense looking at it this way. Look what happens to our pies when we go from stage three or four to stage eight. There's not a lot of difference between stage zero where we started and stage eight where we're eventually these systems are gonna end up. So we're just trying to kick it over to stage eight as quick as we can with our restoration projects and get those benefits back. And you might be thinking, why not take it back to stage zero? Like if stage zero is so great, why don't you just take it back there? And the reality is, is that we've put so much stuff on the surface of the earth that in most places you can't go back to stage zero because you're gonna flood your roads, you're gonna flood your houses, you're gonna flood your schools. So it's not, in some places it is realistic and there is like, if you Google stage zero, there's a whole stage zero contingent of people out there that are doing stage zero work and it's awesome, it's super fascinating, but it's in places where we have very little infrastructure. Um, so stage zero restoration is a big deal, but stage eight is the next big deal because it works around those constraints and allows us to still have roads, but also have habitat alongside of it. So here's a cross section from our Snow Creek plans. This is our, this is our existing condition. You might recognize this ch channel, trapezoidal channel, U-shaped, really in size. You can see our existing two-year event way down in there. These floodplains in, the snow, in Snow Creek never get wet. I went out there recently and uh, we had that really big, uh, really big rain on snow right after our last snow. And the flows in the, in the in Snow Creek came way up. It barely left the channel. You could see where leaves had fallen on the low floodplain there, they hadn't even been swept away. So we're gonna take it from this to this is what our cross section is gonna do. So we're gonna get all of this diversity of all these anastomosing multiple threaded channels. We're actually gonna excavate away a bunch of this high floodplain. We're gonna go in with excavators, we're gonna scoop it out and we're gonna move it up someplace where it's not causing any problems and plant trees on it. Um, and get this reconnected to, we call this an inset floodplain. So it has a floodplain again. It's not the historic floodplain. If we put it up on its historic floodplain, for one, at the bottom end of the project, we'd have an eight foot waterfall. And for two, we'd have water up on Uncas Road and Highway 101. So that's not gonna work. So this is what we do instead. And you can see the diversity of habitat we have. Look at all the wood we have. Look at what we get to have for shade from all the trees growing on all these little islands out there. 
So here's another real life example. Like, does this stuff actually work? So the Lummi Nation did a project, I think in 2016, on this reach of the Nooksack River. Look at this reach from what you learned in this talk. Not a lot going on here. Pretty straight, very little wood, no side channels. And I bet if we showed it in cross section, we'd see a trapezoidal channel. This is what they did. They threw giant log jams at it. I mean, the Nooksack's a good sized river, right? Giant log jams. I'm gonna go back and forth a couple of times and just look how basically this big log jam in the center of the screen. This is the primary part of the project is just this log jam. They did a little one here and they did a little work up here. But look how that log jams in a couple of years after being installed, took a river system like this and went like that. So you'll see that it activated a side channel here. The flow's going this way. It now has a side channel that when the flows come up, part of the water kicks off that way. It has a flood channel that it formed here. And even here at low flow, you can see there's a channel coming around the side. Remember that tiny, tiny little coho salmon I showed you in super shallow water? This is the kind of habitat they were hanging out in. It's a super shallow, quiet water. They're not out here in the big water. <clears throat> you got all these river bars that have formed. I mean, that's good for humans too, right? That's where you like to go sunbathe. There's no place to sunbathe here. It's all cobble. Down here, it's sand and gravel. So, okay, well, so it looks cool on the face of the earth. That's great. What does it mean to the fish? So the Lummi Nation is pretty smart. They checked out how many reds were in this reach before the project and how many after. And you'll see about a four-fold increase in the number of reds, number, number of salmon nests that were in this reach. And this is probably about a half mile reach of stream again uh, before and after the project. So it works. And not only that, but we're not having those big scouring events so that now that there's 25 reds in this entire reach, those reds are probably also way more successful than the six or seven that were there before. So little bites like this, and this is happening all over Washington state. This is happening all over Oregon, Northern California. And little steps like this do start to make a difference. And I think you can see how that would work. Uh, so it's important work, uh, it's exciting work, uh, and it's happening, and it's happening right in our backyard, and it's happening out on the Hoko River, and it's happening all over the state. Tribes are working on it, fish enhancement groups are working on it, uh, and it's uh, it's fun to be involved with it. So, if you want to see a restoration project that the Jamestown Sklalem tribe just did, um, that's I, it might be, I don't know if you call it stage eight or not, but it's a floodplain reconnection project and a side channel project. This is on the Dungeness River, uh, just upstream from the Dungeness Fish Hatchery. Uh, last summer, uh, the summer before, Jamestown Tribe acquired this big property right here. And this is the Dungeness River. And they took and they built a side channel through the property where there used to be a giant trophy home, built the side channel, that would have been there historically before there was a trophy home with a great big bulkhead in front of it. And uh, actually this, this fall, we saw salmon spawning in the ch channel. We'll expect that there'll be tons of juveniles hanging on that channel. And this is just a little glimpse of um, some of the other restoration work that's happening on the peninsula. And we have a planting there uh, coming up in a couple of weekends. Uh, there was a, we had 70 people out there this weekend planting trees and Yes, totally awesome. I think some of them might be in this room. <laughs> More than probably a couple, uh, but it's happening again. So if you want to see uh, a restoration project and what it looks like uh, on the ground, I encourage you to get out and go check out this site um, and see some of what NOSC does. And that opportunity will happen again soon uh, because this summer we'll be building the Snow Creek Uncas Preserve restoration project. So coming soon to a creek near you, uh, you will have a big restoration project happening and uh, there will be plantings associated with that as well. <clears throat>